this is Lee Henson Hasty. I'm Senior Director of Theological Education Funds Development with the Presbyterian Foundation. Um, with the Theological Education Fund, it's a ministry of the Committee on Theological Education, and I'm here with um, a mentor to so many preachers, including myself, uh, the Reverend Dr. Barbara Brown Taylor, <laughs> uh, to talk with us about attentiveness from the farm. And I think she's calling in from the farm, in fact, today. So she's she's attending to that. Welcome to the show today, Barbara. Oh, thank you, Lee, for asking me. And yes, indeed, I am on a farm and it's 70 degrees in March. So balmy here. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. In Louisville, Kentucky, we have the same, and we're loving it. Um, we can be outside, and um, that's a good thing in the midst, uh, uh, as we round this uh, second lap um, with the pandemic, it's good to have outside space to be moving around in so safely and nicely. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, first of all, for the way you do lead theologically in so many different ways through your writing and your preaching and your teaching. Um, and uh, as we move into this topic about attentiveness from the farm and in the midst of this pandemic, I first want to ask what I always ask my um, my guest is uh, about their call. And I love how Thur Howard Thurman um, asked that question. I know you contributed recently to a book with uh, edited by Greg Ellison on Thurman, so you probably thought about Thurman a little bit, uh, anchored in the current. Um, Thurman asked, what is it? Uh, that is making you come alive because what the world needs is people who are coming alive. And I've even heard you ans ask this question um, as something about what is saving your life. I don't know if that's from Thurman or not. So I'll give you both of those questions. Sure. No, I stole that from John Claypool when I spoke at his church in Birmingham a long time ago. I said, but John, what will I talk about? And he said, oh, just tell us what's saving your life now. And I thought it was the best question that <laughs> wow. when, when he, he went back to God, I just took it. And now people think I thought of that. So um, what is saving okay. my life now? Um, being a smart aleck who asked that of other people, I realized my answer changed every day, if not weekly. It might even change several times during a day. So it turns out that's not one thing. But what we're talking about today has, because if I'm attentive to what's going on, that changes about three times a day minimum. So so what's saving my life now is figuring out how to be, um, how to come out of this pandemic. I retired from full-time teaching four years ago. I stayed busy. The pandemic grounded me. Uh, I am pretty much of a hermit. So the first year of that was wonderful. And then the second year, my whole personality changed. And I think retirement sank in because I was disabled in, I was vocationally disabled. I couldn't fly the places I had flown. I wasn't interested in spending more time in front of a computer screen. And I haven't come out of this cloud of unknowing yet. So I know it's a blessed place to be. It's just not a particularly comfortable one. Um, so attentiveness seems important to the movement of the spirit and to the counsel of my friends and to the, the blowing of the wind. That's uh, I, I'm I'm kind of feel like I'm looking out your window now to see those things, <laughs> the wind mm -hmm. blowing. When you look out and see the wind blowing, what do you see moving out there? Oh, I see so much moving. Half the time I hear it before I see it, but more and more. Okay. Even when I'm on a computer indoors, it it's a laptop facing a window. Today, I saw a, a huge white cloud, like a pillar of cloud in the wilderness. It's been burning for two days, whatever it is, but it's a white cloud that has come straight up like a volcano steam hmm. chute and is moving across the horizon. So the beauty of that is its, um, it's movement tells me where the wind is going, as do the clouds that rise up out of a valley. Um, next to my house. First time I saw the earth make a cloud, I shouted out loud. So I see the trees <laughs> moving. I see clouds in the sky. I see birds being blown around, um, not being able to get where they mean to go because the wind is strong. So lots of things. Lots of things are moving. Um, you said that the, um, I think I heard you say the 
the pandemic had grounded you, and then uh, I see you grounded and looking up and around. Um, how, how has it grounded you, do you think? What used to ground me and what grounds me now and what will ground me in the future, I'm sitting at, at the center of those three things because we're talking about identity, mm -hmm. I think, and identities related to age is one at the beginning of a vocation, in the middle mm -hmm. of it, retired from it. Vocation has to do with what's happening in the world. And uh, it also has to do with, I think I just said vocation and I meant identity with what's happening in the world. But, mm -hmm. but mine was very grounded before in my productivity, in the dates on my calendar, keeping my website updated, making my deadlines, remembering to get to the airport two hours early instead of when the plane took off, which meant I would not get where I was going. And with the pandemic, as everyone listening knows, that stopped. That stopped in about a week. Mm. And I wasn't on an airplane again for 18 months. And so my identity's in, in a big shift right now. And you're going to have to keep calling me back to the question over and over again because of that. Because I've also gotten like situational <laughs> dementia where I just don't know where anything is or what day it is. I have to get up every morning and drill myself on the calendar right. because I've gotten in a kind of place of flow um, during this time apart. But the identity shifting and I'm now needing to be grounded in different things and they're turning out to be family. They're turning out to be the domestic mm. arts. They're turning out to be de doing things that no one's impressed with, remembering birthdays and going to funerals and driving sick friends to the doctor and delivering a meal and all the things people do, but I haven't done much of because I've been going to airports and keeping my website updated. So it's it's a shift and there's a surrender in it and a little tiny bit of a shamedness, but I, I, I know it's a foolish one, but I think I'm sinking into my humanity and that that's the vocation mm. that's going on right now in a different way. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds like there's some gratefulness on your part that <laughs> um, maybe this, this, the pandemic in part is a gift um, even, but something you're still unwrapping maybe, uh, to understand what it exactly means is, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. You and I corresponded once in preparation for this talk and, and I likened this long slowdown as like an extended Sabbath, which I have often thought of uh, the period mm -hmm. of retirement in one's life as being, uh, I also talked about how we all became shut-ins over the past two years. It was so right. interesting to me that I all of a sudden had things in common with 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds. And, and even children who were being homeschooled were shut-ins. And I think there's not a one of us right. who, who didn't think about mortality a little more and about diminished physical activity, even if all of our muscles and bones worked. We were still curtailed, leashed, hobbled in some ways. And then where we lived, you know, took on new import. I, I know a lot of people got new mattresses in the last two years or hung new right. curtains. <laughs> and people who always said that church is a people, not a place, started longing for their right. church places. So, you know, a lot of a lot of ways people grounded themselves shifted. What is home? You know, what is church? Is it a people? Is it also a sacred place? What's my identity? What, what am I made to do in this period of my life? How have the changes in the world changed what I'm called to do? Um, and then, you know, the mm -hmm. old Beekner thing of where does, you know, my, my vitality meet the vitality of what needs to be done in the world? Right, right. Um, and you're and there's time to notice those things it sounds like and and your particular context is on your farm and so you mentioned things like the domestic arts and um other things happening around the farm the clouds outside um that you're able to see i mean i can see those in the city but probably not in quite the the um, vastness uh, that you're able to see from where you uh, spend your time what do you think um, being on the farm in that context in the midst of this, to how that how has that shaped you and what are you learning there? 
Yeah, and I want, lest this be too romantic, we'll come back to roosters in a minute. But how it has shaped my context <laughs> is incredible gratitude to be able to walk out my front door. I mean, I have friends who are apartment dwellers in cities, and they can get out. And, you know, one friend in D.C. just put on her mask and kept up her daily runs. But but she found out that running with a mask on was a lot harder. But just the luxury of living right. at the end of a a two mile road and I can walk four miles a day and just wave at a neighbor walking a border collie. So so the incredible luxury of living in the country at this time where social isolation is mm. just built in. You're just not all, all over your neighbors out here. Um, but it isn't mm -hmm. romantic because, you know, during the same two years the electricity's gone off for days at a time and oh, no. that means the well shuts down and that means my two old broken down horses can't drink and I've got to haul water for them or Ed, my husband, has to get it and it means that not too long ago a chicken sat down on eight eggs and my husband who's a complete softy let her have them and now I've got like six roosters jumping on two hens and I keep telling them it's incest and it's not going anywhere good for the flock but We've got, you know, we, we had a bear bend over the bird feeder the other night and eat all the grain out of it. So it's a place of, oh, it's, it, no. it, well, it's not wilderness because there's nothing here that can kill me except a neighbor who's careless with a gun. But it's at least got some elemental <laughs> aspects to it with the uncertainty of electricity and heat and water that I didn't worry about a lot when I lived in a city zip code. So... So all of that is super helpful for staying grounded, because if I lose focus too long, if I watch the clouds too long, I'm going to look out at empty food bowls and animals that have lost right. weight while I've been, you know, doing my dreamy thing. So my, um, right. my investment is required here if everybody's going to stay alive. Right. There is there's some interdependence. Uh, I hear you saying... Um, on the farm and maybe anywhere else you are that you're we're not alone even though we may be shut in and i remember early on um you know giving thanks and, and literally saying prayers thankful for the the garbage people like nobody's business and the, mm -hmm. the grocery store clerks mm -hmm. uh, you know who are risking their lives um to make sure that we were safe um there's an interrelatedness that that you start to notice i think um or at least I have, and and how I am so so shaped by those around me, um, the natural world as well as other other human beings. No, know. and I'm glad you said that because you just made it. It's not about the farm or the city. It's about what's your locale, what's your locality. Mm -hmm. So you can be as attentive. Mm -hmm. You're right to to think about grocery store checkout clerks as essential workers, but they are and were. And they, and, th and they took risks so the rest of us could get our milk and eggs and bottled water. And to become attentive 100%. to that, yeah, big deal. Mm -hmm. It is. I've, I've, uh, I, I've, I make it a point now to look down at, and make sure I know their name and call them by name and thank them <laughs> um, by name, which I, I should, you know, should have done uh, much earlier. But now there are new rhythms uh, and, and realities that I think are we're more attentive to. Um, there is sort of a, a difficulty in the midst of this, though. I mean, you're not shy from saying that, it seems. I know you've written a lot about darkness and doubt, and um, and I'm just wondering if you're thinking about those things differently now. Um, and as you, and I hear you, don't have this figured out. You're, you're wandering around a little bit still to figure out, you know, who you are and what you're about um now and and thanks for saying you know each day each hour <laughs> um you know trying to figure that out um so i'm just i'm wondering if is some of that thinking around darkness and doubt has shifted for you also on radio you're not supposed to let this much dead space go by right um yeah, it's fine. yeah. I'm glad I have a pillar of cloud going on in the sky right now because I'll just sort of <laughs> sit on the porch and see which way that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I made 
<laughs> took you to a to a bad place. I'm so sorry. Well, I here's here's a struggle. Ironically, I was asked to be a teacher in something called the Forest Dwelling Program at Oblate School of Theology in San Antonio. That's a Roman Catholic seminary, and it was a two year program on spirituality in in the last part of life, and. That aged me pretty mm. quickly be, because I never had children. I never had a child to look at to say, oh, gosh, the kid's 30 now. I must be aging. I always figured if I ever had a you know a baby, I don't know, it'd be a newborn. No, if I had a child, it'd be about, you know, like 50 now. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a way in which the pandemic, <laughs> right. the pandemic, I don't know what, but but everything came zooming into relief. So I'm, I'm, I, I still am in love with the dark and I'm an habitual, addictive questioner, mm. if not doubter, at least a questioner mm. of everything that goes by. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the question right now is, will I conform to the questions I'm asked so regularly. What are you working on now? What's your next book? What's your project? What are you up to? How much will I continue right. to suffer that I don't have an adequate answer to that? And how much will I say, you know, this is my forest dwelling time. And and hmm. and what I'm doing is uh, I, I bought some watercolors or, see, this feels horrible for a minister to say, I bought some watercolors? When no. did Jesus watercolor? I mean, even when he tried to go off by himself, nobody would let him. So it's a real problem, you know, to have um, a vocation that did not include watercolors. Nor, nor, well, it had Sabbath in it. So, so I'm as in love with darkness as I ever was. Uh, but I am wondering where where my position will be with peers who expect me, want me to be productive. And, and my friends kind of fall out in two categories. And everybody who's listening, you're going to get there. Your friends are going to fall into two categories. One's going to want to watercolor with you. And, and one is going to tell you, you got to stay active or you're going to get old. You need a plan. You need, right. what, what do you call them? Encore. You need an encore career. You know, what's your encore career? And I am wearied by those questions, right? Right now, it seems disrespectful, yeah. uh, you know, of my gray hair to be worried about my encore career. So, <laughs> so that's really I didn't even think about this till you asked me if I've stayed on the subject at all. But, but that is probably a question for any age, and I really think a bunch of young people are asking right. it right now. Do I want to go back to the same job I left? Um, is it time to you know oh, go it's... buy a crummy sailboat and fix it up and live on it? Like what? What now? I'm not the only one. No, you definitely aren't. I mean, as soon as you said that, I mean, the conversations I'm having and many of mine are with pastors from across the country, mostly Presbyterian and some right in the center, let's say, of the prime, you might even say of their, their call and they're stepping away and not necessarily stepping into anything, but just stepping away. They're tired. They're worn out. They're fatigued. They're not sure where God is present for them. And, and I'm thinking I'm going to call them back and, and ask if they're doing watercolor <laughs> or, you know, what are they doing to kind of keep them engaged? I, I, I will also say I know a bunch of pastors right now um, who are posting artwork. So something may be happening there um, and, and in a good way to keep folks engaged, um, to find that thing. My, you know, when you said it to me and, and some of my listeners already know, my sort of sideline gig is um uh I umpire field hockey and that is not nearly <laughs> maybe as uh, reflective you might say as as doing uh watercolors or any artwork but for me it allows me to not think about all these bigger questions and think about one thing for one hour in one particular space and that sabbath you know that's a gift you know that's all i can do for that particular hour um no, I think it's very much something maybe especially pastors uh, should be asking and probably other people of faith too is, um, you know, what is it that can help? I feel like that watercolor must help nurture you uh, and feed you in some way. Well, it um, that now, is uh, refreshing. Well, when so. you talk about umpiring, you put your finger on it. It's just to be focused on one thing. 
for an hour instead of Correct. 172 things, which is what I'll do unimpeded. But honest to goodness, people can get that at the bowling alley. They can get it rock climbing. They can get it planting spring Correct. bulbs. They can, I mean, for sure, I mean, umpiring, good grief, Lee, you're saving young lives and, and modeling athletic <laughs> civility. I mean, you're up to big stuff there. <laughs> so, but, but the idea of a single focus... <laughs> And and also while you were talking, I remembered a phrase Marva Dawn, now of blessed memory, talked about worship as a royal waste of time, and and Sabbath is a right. royal waste of time, and and I don't think umpiring hockey is, but watercolor is definitely a royal waste of time, but but <laughs> it, it seems to me anything that aids attentiveness, you got to keep your eye on that game, mm. don't you? You can't afford to have adult ADD or. Wh- whatever oh, it is. I mean, you've it, got it to is keep 100% your... 100 <laughs> percent if you're not attentive. 100 <laughs> percent. That's right. right. So, so probably it's it anything, but it's it's um, but it's not uh, it's productive in a whole different way. I keep interrupting you. Please go ahead. No, 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 no. You're you're perfectly fine. Um, uh, I'm I'm jumping onto the in my mind and in my imagination onto the hockey field right now. So. <laughs> One hundred percent. You have to be attentive. You can't can't hopefully miss anything. Um, and I think practices like that um, uh, may be a way through this and to understand who we are and the shifts, all the shifts that are taking place that we can't control. I have a fifteen year old daughter. That's who got me into the field hockey, and we're always talking about. Um, you know, control what you can control. <laughs> and um, I can control, you know, um, stepping away, stepping back, thinking through, you know, what I'm going to do or say. There's, there's some things I can't control, but I think there's, um, there are things that I can. And, and um, I keep go- using this word practice, and I, I think it's because of altars in the world. Um, are there any new practices or practices within, say, paying attention or reverence uh, that, that you are thinking about these days um, to help guide you forward, um, see where God is calling you next. Um, and I'm not going to ask you what you're working on. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you just you asked me where share. God's calling me next. That sounds like I'm required to be on a journey, Lee. <laughs> it it may yes, only be to my... I think you are. <laughs> um First of all, when you started that, I'll get to new practices, though I always hate that because there's not enough religious practice in it. But you you reminded me of a clergy group I was in when I first moved to Clarksville. There were about five of us. And at one point, we were all talking about what we did a la umpiring or whatever we did. One of us taught Italian Mm -hmm. at a community college. One of us was a first responder with a fire department. One was a professional clown. Mm -hmm. And the fourth person just sat there quietly and he said, oh my gosh, I don't have a second thing I do. I only do one thing. I only pastor my church. And he left there committed to finding a second thing he did that wasn't directly related to his vocation. And, you know, and, and, uh, among those things that the rest of us did that were our avocations, not our vocations, but the things we did for love um, ended up really saving our lives in our vocations. So again, it it turns out, I didn't know this, it's really something to start thinking about earlier in a vocation and not late, or you'll just be stumped when you you know, fall off the edge into a day mm-hmm. that stretches out like many days have stretched out over the last two years. But my practices, I mean, I hate to be blithe about it, but it, it's everything from chopping carrots and carrying water. Isn't that a Zen thing? Only it's chopping wood. But even three <laughs> watercolor classes, I've only had three, but all of a sudden I'm driving down an asphalt road and I realize I, I see the blue in the asphalt that I never saw before because if I wanted to paint it, it would require blue and and i realized that in that new tree just starting to come out there is there's a kind of red pink in with the 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 green and that's not saving anybody's life but howard thurman whom we started out talking about said it's so important to have community within the self as well as community with other people and I've been fixed on that lately, is what are the practices that bring me into community with myself? And I think he would be happy if I capitalized S because he was 
Quaker at heart, I think, mm. in that the divine light right. is in us as well as within us and among us. But um, So the practices are all the way from that to formal sitting meditation, you know, 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night, an hour of reading stuff that isn't meant to go anywhere in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I could go on and on and on. At this point in my life, uh, my spiritual practice is anything I do with attentiveness to the spirit. So it's not particularly religious stuff anymore, if it ever has been. What's what's spiritual about it is my, is the attention I give to it. And where do you see God showing up? I, um, I talked to pastors too, and I guess they always have felt this, and even more so lately, is a sort of um, expectation that they're going to be able to help sort of conjure the spirit for others. But, but I hear them more and more saying, but I'm not sure I even know where... Um, the Holy Spirit is now in my own life, or that presence is with me now. Um, and they're very disciplined in their practices, but it's 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 like there is um, a wall or a veil or <laughs> something that's there. Um, maybe it's um, maybe it's because the world is shifting underneath us. I don't know what it is. Um, but it feels like right here in the midst of Lent, this is a good time to sort of really notice what the Holy Spirit is up to, and what the divine is up to. And so um, where do you see and where have you noticed lately um, God showing up? In my vocabulary, your you're talking about what are the places of direct experience. In other words, not mediated experience, right. not the books I'm reading, not the sermons I hear, but what what are right. reliable places of direct experience of the divine? And that doesn't mean blissful divine. That can mean terrifying div divine. That can mean challenging divine. Correct. It can mean all kind limiting divine. Right. But but in many ways, those are human places and they how many times have you heard people say how close they feel to god in nature right nature's a, a predictable mm. a place of direct encounter and i'm i'm on purpose not using the word of mystical encounter because that scares people especially presbyterians i don't know why but um <laughs> illness is a predictable place of direct experience of the divine of the mm. ultimate of the real um community especially i hate to say it but it can be anything from nascar to evensong but the experience of the spirit moving in and among community so that prayer is different in community and singing is different in community and cheering is different in community. Eros, desire, um, physical, sexual desire, as well as desire for a great meal and perhaps, depending on you, a fabulous bottle of wine. But um, there are reliable places that human beings have experienced directly the divine. I think our problem is when we then want to f make it formulaic return to the same place, hold our mouths the same way, mm -hmm. say the same words, and it's supposed to happen again. Maybe Holy Communion works that way. Maybe Holy Baptism does. Maybe that's why we call those things sacramental. But yeah, I think that is why we call those things sacramental, mm -hmm. is they're meant to be, if attended to, reliable places of direct experience. But sometimes the cloud of unknowing is my place of direct experience, and I can't see a damn thing. You know, all I know is it's <laughs> powerful, and I trust some of the early church fathers, and I'm sorry, I'd love to call them mothers, but they were mostly fathers, who pointed out to me right. that minority tradition, a voice that the less you can see, the closer you are to God, because God is the is vested in opaque splendor. Therefore, cloudy mm. vision is a sign that you're in a close place, not a far place. But I have never got that teaching when I was younger. So it helps me to remember that for any of us who are in between right now, it's not comfortable, but it's sacred. It's liminal. It's a threshold. And I'm told that... Liminal, yeah. yeah it's in between. 
That's such a hopeful message, I think, to hear. I hear that personally. I think for others it will be too, is in the midst of, and, and I think you just in life experience, those times in young adulthood, whenever it was where you're like, you had no idea what's going, which do I go left, right, you know, straight or back up a few steps. Um, it's in those places, actually, maybe you're closest and in those difficult suffering places as well, uh, where, you know, when you look back, you can see, uh, you may not hear it and see it and feel it right at that moment, but, those were, you know, you're being guided. I'm thinking my own vocational journey and it was others. I, you, it's helpful to say like, pay attention to community. That's communion. That is, it doesn't just have to be bread and wine and cup at a table. Uh, you're talking about, you're right. We've expanded our, uh, I think more people have expanded their definition of church beyond uh, the walls of a building. Um, and uh, I've seen that happen on my porch with a gathering of just a few friends, you know, um, and here in Kentucky, you know, it's not just wine, mm -hmm. it's bourbon too, <laughs> or, or maybe another, it may be a soda or just you know, sparkling <laughs> water. It doesn't really matter, but it's that, those moments where you can be together, listen, be heard, um, maybe work on something together, uh, you know, that, that has some purpose, whatever it might be that, you know, paying attention to the uh, community and the communities, the different places that you can engage with others, uh, even if it's waving to the to the neighbor and their their border collie, <laughs> where you know you're just saying, "Hey, there's a connection between us. I see you." I love our friend, uh, mutual friend, Greg Ellison um, is so good about saying, "You know, I see you, and it's good to see you." And and we need to be seen, you know, and we need to see others, and that's. I think what you're describing is is that even if we can't see the way forward, we have each other um, in the midst of this. And that is so hopeful. Um, I feel like I cannot believe our time is is running out here. There's so many other things <laughs> I'd love to talk about. And um, uh, but uh, maybe that's a good place to close in the midst of this cloud of unknowing and and other questions to ask and and um, and I hope we do keep asking them and keep walking around as you say in the dark and and noticing and um, and paying attention. One of my my favorite um, stories uh, that, that I think you have told is around I think your father. Uh, helping you lay on your back and look up at the stars. So I'm, I'm thinking tonight that might be what I do. And maybe others will find something like that um, where they can start to notice uh, the spirit moving. Um, I wish, uh, and I'm going to invite you, I know it's not an Episcopalian thing <laughs> uh, to do um, a, a, a charge and benediction uh, so much, uh, more than just a simple blessing, but I'd love to invite you to to send us on our way, to bless us, to charge our listeners um, as we go. And and before I do that, let me be sure to say thank you, thank you for who you are and what you represent, and and how you continue to guide and have guided us. And um, that person who you are is not just because of your productivity and writing and your preaching and all of those things that matters certainly but it's because of you are Barbara Brown Taylor you are your person and you have authenticity and who you are um, even in this new um, phase it sounds like of your life and um, thank you for being you um, as a child of God and um, I look forward to hearing your blessing to us <laughs> Well, it'll be a stolen blessing from someone. This is like quilt making, right? You just take pieces from everybody and go forward. Um, and my introduction to it is is also my postscript, which is we will remember this time later, but we're in it now. And its shape will change as we remember it. And it's another reason to take a breath inside the cloud of unknowing and let it be. So this is a, a blessing of change. What we choose changes us. Who we love transforms us. How we create remakes us. Where we live reshapes us. So in all our choosing, God make us wise. In all our loving, Christ make us bold. In all our creating, Spirit give us courage. 
In all our living, may we become whole and the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit, be upon all you who listen and those you love and those for whom you pray this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen and amen. Thanks thanks again and, and blessings uh, on your day. Um, and uh, if you need some help carrying the water, <laughs> reach out and ask. I'll do <laughs> There it. may be others. Okay, I will. Okay. Thanks so much, <laughs> Lee. Take, take good care. <laughs>